Welcome everybody to the Iran Brooks Show, Living Objectivism. We're going to be talking about, today, we're going to be talking about a novel I just finished reading. And I don't usually talk about novels and, and books, well, of course, other than Ayn Rand's books. Uh, but this one is so relevant to everything I've been talking about in the last few weeks that I, I just couldn't resist. And it's so, I mean, the novel's not a, I, I don't think the novel's a good novel. I think the novel has huge aesthetic problems. It's basically unbelievably naturalistic. But it is a really, really interesting novel. It, 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 and, and it relates, again, to the specific issues I've been talking about, which is the future of Europe, the problem of Islam, uh, and, and the future of Western civilization, and the question of what is uh, Western civilization? What is Western civilization? So, uh, you know, so we're going to be talking about a little bit about those. And I've talked about them a lot recently, so I'm not going to, I'm going to try not to repeat a lot of what I've said. But I want to talk about it in the context of this novel. Now, let me just say, I think the novel is definitely worth reading. It's called Submission. It's by a, a French author by the name of Michel Houellebecq. I don't, don't give me a hard time. I don't speak French and these names. I mean, the spelling is ridiculous in this name. So uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if the spelling, if, if the name's right. But Michelle Hulebeck, the novel is Submission. And I guess the novel, it, it, Michelle Hulebeck is, is a very well-known French novelist, is considered uh, one of the great novelists of his generation, not just in France, but all over the world. He's been a best-selling author. He's won prizes. He's done very, very well uh, as a French novelist. He, he is definitely uh, a naturalist. Uh, and, and we'll talk more about kind of his philosophy the author's philosophy. I also want to uh, read uh, to you from an interview he did about the novel. But the novel really achieved notoriety uh, two and a half years ago, and, and it, well, almost three years ago. And I feel kind of bad talking about the novel only in the sense that the novel came out a long time ago, and I only got to read it now. And, and uh, I got to read it. Uh, let me tell you how I got to read it, and, and, uh, and then I'll tell you how it got notorious. But I... I, I came to read it because I was doing an event with Fleming Rose. I, I, those of you who don't know who Fleming Rose is, Fleming Rose was the publisher who published the Danish cartoons in 2005. And I got to know him in 2006, and we've become friends, and uh, we've done a lot of events together since 2006. And I was in Copenhagen, and we were doing a, a debate on can civilization continue, survive, if you will, in a multi ethnic, multicultural, multi-religious world. And, uh, you know, and that's, so, so it's, it's an it's a, it's a interesting question. It's an important question. It's a crucial question that, that Europe is uh, engaged in right now. It's a question that Islam brings to the forefront, given the extent to which Islam is, um, it, it, you know, is... Uh, dominant, if you will, as an alternative, if you will, culture in Europe right now. And it, so it was a great event, and I, I think there might be video or audio of it. I'm going to try to locate it and maybe put it up on the podcast. But, uh, but in the Q&A, uh, Fleming was asked about this book, Submission, and he, he, he basically said it was a great book and, and a really important book, and a really important book in terms of this question this question of Islam and the question of the future in Europe and the question of the various alternatives and how the future of Europe will actually evolve. So I, I picked it up and started reading it, and, and I got into it. It's, it's, very, it's, it's well written, I think. I don't know if I would have read it, if I would have finished it, unless I was interested in the particular issue uh, that the book deal, deals with, which is the future of Europe. And, and it deals with, I think, very, from an intellectual perspective, from a philosophical perspective, from an, from an ideological perspective. And I think it deals with it very, um, how do I say, very smartly. So it's a smart setup. It's a clever way of presenting a point of view. And the point of view is pretty shocking, but the point of view is very much in line with my views about the West and about Western civilization. Uh, the author disagrees with me completely philosophically. We'll get to that. I mean, he's a completely on the other side. But because of that, he sees where this is heading in a way that I think a lot of people are missing. And um, 
because he is, I think this author is Europe in a sense that he represents the intellectual landscape of Europe. He is what Europe is right now. And his character in the book is Europe, represents Europe and, and the, the choices that Europe faces or the choices the character faces and the attitude and the philosophical framework of the character are the, are the, are the attitudes and philosophical framework of Europe. So in many respects, this novel, this story about this individual is a story about, about a, a much bigger story about Western civilization, at least in its European manifestation, because I think it's an American manifestation is quite different. So we can get to that. Um, we can get to that. One. If you, if, by the way, if you want to call in, uh, feel free to do so. 347-324-3075. 347-324-3075. Now, let me just say, because I see somebody's already got a question mark and want, already wants to talk, that if you're calling in, I want you to call in on this topic, not on some random question. We can do that at the end of the show. But right now, I want you to call about Europe, about Islam, and uh, particularly about this novel. Um, you know, So I'm going to give you like a few seconds to change your mind. Uh, just in case you're not calling about that, and and uh, and then I'm gonna I, I'm gonna take your call in a minute. Let me just say some background information. This novel came out in January, in January uh, on January seventh, actually, 2015, and the date is important because it actually was published on the day of the attack on Charlie Hebdo. So it was published the day uh, the jihadist walked into Charlie Hebdo and killed all those cartoonists and all those journalists. But it's more than that. The cover of Charlie Hebdo on that day was about the novel and about the, the author. So he was on the cover of Charlie Hebdo the day that they were attacked. And of course, that did. A, and of course, the novel deals with the question of Islam in Europe, particularly specifically in France. And that just blew up. And, and now he is a very famous novelist, so the, the novel would have been a bestseller anyway, but here it became a bestseller in, in France instantly, and it became a bestseller all over Europe, and then it was uh, very quickly translated into English, and it came out in, in the UK and in the US, I think in September of 2015. Um, let me just see, when was this? Well, in November, the New York Times wrote two book reviews about the book. It was that deemed that important that they wrote two book reviews. I think they were generally displeased with the first book review. It was a little bit too positive for, for, for their liking. So immediately the following day, they came out with an alternative book review that was much more negative. Uh, it, you know, but really, really, uh, really, really interesting responses. So I, I've been reading reviews of the book because I think you can learn a lot about that. All right, we've got All right good question. I, I put you on mute and, uh, and we're going to leave it at that. So this is about Muslim immigration. So it's somewhat related, uh, but not directly related to, to uh, well, but I, th I think it's within the scope, so I'm going to answer the question. So the question is about Muslim immigration and the difference between Muslim immigration to America versus Muslim immigration to, um, to Europe. And why do they assimilate more in the United States than they do in Europe? Or at least that's what the, what the surveys and the statistics show that they assimilate much better in the United States. And, and the question is, is it because of, in a sense, pre-selection bias? That is, the, the people who are more likely to assimilate are the ones who come to the U.S.? Or is it because the U.S. Um, has some strategy about assimilation that these other countries don't have, that, that European co countries don't have? I, I think it's the second. I think they assimilate in the United States because... In some sense, American society demands that they assimilate. We, we still expect people to integrate into our society. We also have a, a much more robust uh, workforce. We have uh, we, um, what we don't do is what we do do is assimilate them into the workforce. For example, uh, most Muslim immigrants get a job in the United States. That's not true in Europe. The, the, the welfare so generous over there with these, uh, with these uh, uh, new immigrants that many of them never have a job. And I think work 
and the value that Americans in particular place on work and, and the, the social value, the, the, the value, the, the socialization that happens in America uh, at work is how they assimilate into American society. And I think in Europe, A, there's not a lot of importance placed on work, the, but also they, uh, they don't have to work, right? They get their social benefits whether they work or not. So, so they, are, they are segregated from the perspective of, of where they live. You know, in my view, Europeans are far, far more racist than Americans are. Uh, you know, they, they, they're very highfalutin and they, they accuse us of racism all the time and so on. But, but Europeans are, are incredibly racist and they have no interest in having these immigrants among them. And they keep them out in neighborhoods far away. So it's not just the immigrants not wanting to live with the Europeans. It's much more the Europeans who don't want them. So they keep them out. They don't get them jobs. And so they don't really assimilate in any proper significant way. And so I think that's the main reason. Uh, you know, look, most people would like to... Now, okay, so there is, there is a sense in which you might be right about the self-selection bias, if you will. So because we provide less welfare... People who expect less welfare come to the United States and may therefore more assimilate a bill. There is that element as well. So that could be the case. Now, I think, though, that if you, if you gave most of the immigrants, most of the refugees, the option uh, of going to Europe or to come to the U.S., I think most of them would choose the, U choose the U.S., even though that would mean, in a sense, a harder life for them because, not really harder, but in a sense, a harder life for them because they would have to work here and they, uh, they couldn't just cruise and they wouldn't get as rich of welfare benefits. So I think America is still more attractive to Europe for most of these people. Uh, I still think most people who emigrate, most Muslims who emigrate are not emigrating to take over. They're not an army. They're not emigrating. Um, I mean, they may turn into an army, but they're not an army to begin with. They're not emigrating to get welfare. They're emigrating for a better life. They want a better life. Europe provides them with a better life they think, and, and that's what they're seeking. And if they could come to America, most of them would come to America instead, uh, even though in America they'd get fewer social benefits and they'd have to work harder. They'd actually have to work. But that working harder is what assimilates them, is what gets them engaged, it, it what get, makes them part of American society in ways that they're not in French and, and European society. All right. Um, so feel free to... Uh, feel free to ask questions. I think the easiest probably way to ask a question is going to be uh, by chat, either on blog talk, ask a question, do it that way. That way I'll notice it and, uh, and pay attention and, uh, and answer the question. All right. So, uh, that's true of blog talk and of Facebook. If you've got a question. Okay. So let's talk about this book. Let's talk about this book, uh, submission again, came out the day Charlie Hebdo the massacre in Charlie Hebdo happened, the day those journalists and cartoonists were killed. Uh, and this became a, a huge book all over Europe. And, and it's kind of a shame it took me so long to read. Uh, and, but I encourage you to read it. I, I think it's fascinating. It really, really is fascinating. And again, it confirms my thesis. So I'm all for it, right? Because it's a, yeah, I've got a self-confirming bias. Uh, so uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm supportive of it. Uh, all right, so, so what, is, what is the thesis? Well, let me tell you. Tell you. Now, you know, there are no spoilers. It's a naturalistic novel. It's not like there's some big suspense about what's going to happen in the end. So uh, there are going to be spoilers here, but I don't think it really matters. Uh, if you're interested in reading it, go ahead and read it. And, and I don't think the fact that I'm going to tell you what the plot is, because there is no plot, really. Um, all right, so what happens in this novel? So it's, it's, it's really, it's told in first person. It's told from the perspective of a French intellectual, uh, a French intellectual who uh, uh, teaches and studies and writes about literature. And he, he, he's, his um, specific expertise is in a French author I do not really know. Uh, again, I, some, some of the, what the novel did is really show me how little I know about French culture and about uh, uh, French literature and, and, and the history of France. There's a lot of references and quotations and stuff from, uh, from the past that I, I just don't know a lot about. But 
Uh, it, it's about a scholar of Huysman. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Maybe I'm pronouncing it Huysman. Now, it's important to note the Huysman, of course, is a, is a real character. It was, a, was an actual, was an actual uh, author in the late 19th century. Um, decadent, materialistic, um, and his early novels d- d- kind of describe the, the nihilism of materialism and decadence and, and the meaninglessness of life. And then at some point, Heusemann discovers Catholicism and converts to Catholicism and gains spiritual meaning. And there's a whole discussions in the novel about the meaning of this conversion and whether it was conversion about religion or what drove it. And, 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 uh, but but he, he, this guy studies an author who lived a decadent, sex-filled, I don't know, drug and alcohol-filled life and ultimately, and, and wrote about that kind of life, and ultimately found God. He, he went to this particular monastery, the, the Monastery of the Black Virgin, which, which, which has significance in the history of, of France and of the West, because it, it's, it's where, I think, Martel um, defeated the, the Muslims and, and therefore saved, saved West, Western civilization from the Muslim invasion. And, and there's this Black Virgin there, and... Um, uh, this is where he was transformed into a Catholic. So, uh, so we have this academic who studies Huysman and, and his great achievement in his life is writing about Huysman and he teaches and he's in his 40s. I think he's 44. And um, which is the same age I think Huysman uh, converted to Catholicism. And he is this, this, the hero, call him a hero of the novel, the, the, the guy who is... Uh, who is telling you the story. I hate to hear, call him a hero because he's not, he's, he's so much not a hero. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the hero of the novel is also a, um, what would you say? He is a cynic, ultimately kind of a, 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 a he, he, he doesn't view any meaning in life. He has no purpose in life. He's drifting. He, he has, uh, the one thing on his mind is sex. And there are a lot of kind of sex descriptions in the book. Primarily they are, sex is purely materialistic, a purely a, a materialistic, animalistic act. But he is obsessed with it in some regard. And he has, he has these relationships with women. And women... Uh, there are no, I mean, maybe there's one or two kind of intelligent women in, in, in it, but it, women uh, in the entire book, primarily sex objects. It's really, he is, he is a misogynist, if ever there was one, the hero. And it turns out the, the author himself, very little importance to, the role, to, to women and what they are. Women are kind of there to entertain men to, to, or to take care of men when they get old or, or to cook or to, to take care. And, and this fits later on with the whole question of Islam and the attraction of Islam to, to this French intellectual. And, and women, are, you know, it's a sex object. And so every year he picks a student, and he has an affair with that student for a year, and then he breaks up with her at the end of the year. And then he starts over again. And it, at the time he's narrating the novel, he's already bored. He's already bored with that. So it's a typical, I would say what he represents is typical Western kind of European values. He doesn't want kids. He doesn't believe in the future. Um, life is meaningless. There's no point. He doesn't really enjoy his job, but he gets some satisfaction out of his job. But it, it, okay, protagonist is the word I'm looking for, right? He, does, he gets some satisfaction out of the job. And um, it's, it really is the way I view... Most European intellectuals, they, 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 it's not even that he's postmodern. It's more that he doesn't care. He doesn't care. Is, is he a leftist? No, because he doesn't care enough to be a leftist. Is he a right wing? No, because he doesn't care enough to be a right wing. He kind of observes every, politics from a distance. But, and he kind of he doesn't want there to be too much violence. But other than that, he just wants to be left alone. He just wants to be left alone. He, he, he doesn't know much about the world. He doesn't know much history. 
beyond the literature that he has studied and the literature that he teaches. So he's an expert in his field. He's a specialist in his field and knows very little beyond that. Very little. So everything else that's happening in the world, the interpretation of everything that's happening in the world, is all conveyed to him and to us as readers through other characters, through speeches that other characters uh, provide. Right. So um, it's a, uh, it, it really is, uh, it really is uh, interesting, right? And it's interesting because I have this view that so many, Europeans are like this. And this is what the intellectual world of Europe is like. Now, some Europeans are more, how would you say it, are more committed politically to an agenda on the left or an agenda on the right. But as the novel shows, all of it is superficial. All of it is superficial, only nobody's really committed to much because they don't know what Europe stands for. They don't have any connection to civilization and, and this, it's clear in, this, in, in the novel. Europe stands for nothing. Uh, modern Europe stands for nothing. Uh, there's no values. There's no purpose. There's no end game. There's nothing to live for. Happiness is a mirage. You're just floating, drifting through life with nothing, right? Sex. Sex as a distraction more than anything else. Right? I mean, and even sex at some point... For the main character, be starts becoming meaningless. He start he goes to prostitutes because he hasn't found a, a student. We'll get to why he can't find a student, but he, he he just he goes to prostitutes, and even they he doesn't feel anything. He can't feel anything, even physically, it becomes completely meaningless to him. And and this is the state of Europe, in a sense, impotent. It can't reproduce. It has no children. It has no ideas. It doesn't really believe in a future. It's just drifting along, not committed to any ideology. Yeah, you've got some, some postmodernists over here, and you've got some nationalists over here, and you've got some tribalists over there. But nobody's, I mean, and at, the, at the edges, they're committed. But most of the population is just intellectually adrift. And that's what the, hero, the protagonist of this novel is. He's going nowhere doing nothing. He's got some prestige because he's written some important articles about this one author, uh, this one famous French author. But, but, and he teaches, and he goes through the motions. But it's all meaningless, and it's not just his life is meaningless. He portrays most other people's lives as meaningless, particularly his parents. He's got parents who he hasn't seen in six years. They don't really care about him, which is, again, a reflection of this attitude in Europe. We don't care about our children. We don't, you know, we're too self-obsessed. We're too narcissistic to care about children. Um, we don't want children. We're not going to have children. Uh, and there's a whole thesis here that what drives civilization is demography. If you don't have children and other people are having children, they will take you over. And, and, and that's kind of the underlying idea. So this is the character we've got. His parents die. It's not even that he really cares. Uh, he doesn't really know much about them. It's somewhat traumatic for him, but, but again, he's just drifting. He's not a valuer. There are no values here. All right, now, at the same time, what's happening in French politics? Well, you get a sense that there's been a lot of violence, that there's been a lot of upheaval, um, and, and that, they, that Marie Le Pen's party, the National Front, has gained a lot of traction, and um, that the socialists and the typical conservatives are completely impotent. They, 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 they don't stand for anything. They don't represent anything, and they, and they, are, they, they have completely capitulated. And that there's a new political party in France, a new political party in France, and it's called the Muslim Brotherhood. And this new political party is gaining a lot of traction among Muslims, particularly among Muslims, and Muslims are enough to give it some traction. And again, if you, if you know something about uh, French presidential elections, you have this runoff with lots of candidates and the two gets the highest votes go on for a runoff. 
And the Muslim Brotherhood is, is headed by a very intelligent, very sophisticated, um, very educated in a sense of understanding of French culture, uh, uh, born in France, Muslim uh, uh, leader, dresses European and, and talks fluent French and is familiar with French culture and, and has a, a specific agenda but talks about it in terms that the French can understand. And because the Muslims have enough votes and because he's appealing to some non-Muslims, because think about it, what is his agenda as presented? What is this uh, Muslim Brotherhood agenda? Well, it's relatively capitalistic on the economic front. They're not really interested in economics. They want to basically leave things alone. They, they want to get out of the way. They're not big on labor laws or they're not big on heavily regulating. They're quite willing to let the market play itself out. Right? Uh, what is their position in education? This is where their position... Well, that the public schools, like the Sorbonne in Paris, those schools need to become Islamic. And, it, it, you know, they, they say in advance that if they win, that uh, you'll have to become, you'll have to be a, um, a, a Muslim to teach there, and uh, that the students, the female students, will have to be completely covered up if they want to be, attend the university. But other than that, they basically want private schools. So they want to privatize education. And uh, they believe because of, uh, you know, and they're fine with Catholic schools. They're fine with Christian schools. And they believe that the private schools will all be religious schools. And they're fine with, of course, Islamic schools. But they privatize education, which is another kind of appealing thing, right? They, they want to privatize education. You can see some libertarians voting for this party. And, uh, you know, education is only going to be required until the age, until I think the age of 12. After that, uh, they're not going to require education. And the private schools, you can be Christian. In the public schools, to the extent there are public schools, only Muslims can teach. And the Sorbonne, which is where this guy is teaching, is a public school, public university, and therefore is being, once they win, is going to be taken over by the Muslims. Now, uh, so, so this is the situation. Now, it turns out that in, in, this, in this election for president, the, the Marie Le Pen wins by a large margin. But the number two place, is, but she doesn't get 50%, the number two place goes to this Muslim. And now the socialists come in, and it turns out that in order to, because they're so offended by Marie Le Pen, in order to stop Marie Le Pen, they're willing to cut a deal with the Muslims. Now, because the socialists are so unsophisticated, they basically cut a deal that is very good to the Muslims. They, they basically give them education. Um, but then the question is, what are the so the Muslim so the socialists endorsed the Muslim candidate, and then there's the question of what are the kind of the right of center political party, kind of the conservatives, if you will. What are they going to do? Well, the conservatives are kind of attracted to uh, the Muslim party because I mean they're going to get their Christian schools. The conservatives are also attracted to the fact that uh, you know this Muslim party is not going to tolerate gay marriage and it's not going to tolerate a lot of kind of on the social issues. It's not going to tolerate abortion. It's not going to tolerate a lot of the stuff that conservatives don't like. So they, so some of the social policy that this Muslim political party is, uh, is going to... So, they, so basically the conservatives agree to a grand coalition where they and the socialists endorse the Muslim party all against the National Front, uh, Marie Le Pen's National Front. Because the one thing that's intolerable that they will not stand for is nationalism and fascism and, and kind of the, the Marie Le Pen the Marie Le Pen view. And of course, as a consequence, the Muslim wins. And he's very sophisticated, very suave, very easygoing, very friendly. But the university that our protagonist is working at becomes an Islamic university. And they offer him a very lucrative pension that he can leave. Um, and uh, in order to stay at the university, he would have to convert to Islam. 
Now, this is the thing the protagonist faces. He knows his life is empty and meaningless. He knows something has to give. He knows he has to go somewhere to gain an anchor. Or in, uh, in, 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 if you think about it in terms of Dr. Lena Peikoff's DIM, the DIM hypothesis, he needs an integrated system to live his life because he, he, he's actually considering suicide. Life is truly meaningless to him. So he follows in the footstep of this man he, 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 he is studying, Hoisman, and, and he tries to connect with Christianity. And he goes to the monastery and he tries to get the vibe, the spiritual vibe from this black virgin or from the Christian teaching. And he really, really makes an effort, really makes an effort to connect with Christianity. He's a complete D2 in a dim hypothesis uh, framework. He's a completely disintegrated human being. And he wants M. He wants, he wants to be integrated somehow. And the only alternative he sees is, is, is Christianity. You know, Islam is too strange. And he tries. He really tries. But when he goes to church, it's like, this is the past. This is old. This is dying. This is decay. This is what you were projected already once. And he's not interested. He, 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 he can't do it. He can't turn to Christianity. So he's back at his kind of disintegrated, nihilistic, you know, uh, uh, or hedonistic, just empty life. And, you know, he, he gets approached to do a, a productive project. And, he, and again, he gets excited about being productive. And he realizes that he needs, again, something. He needs something to integrate his life. He needs something to, 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 to motivate him, to drive him so he, he, he can live well. He's, he, he hasn't got a girlfriend. His girlfriend, actually, the last girlfriend he had was Jewish, and she's gone. She's gone to Israel. She's escaped France and because all the Jews are being encouraged to leave France by, by this Muslim uh, president. And so he, he's still kind of searching, and he's approached by the president of the Sorbonne University, who has a lot of money, lots of money, because the Saudis... Of course, are pouring money into France. They're building schools. They're building madrasas, and and they are they are uh, you know they have uh, invested a lot of money in the Sorbonne, and because of that, they are spending lavishly. And a number of very prominent French academics have converted to Islam so that they can continue, so that they continue their career. Right. So now. He's being, and there's long segments where this guy advocates for Islam, the president of the university, who later becomes, uh, goes to the government and becomes ultimately becomes foreign minister because there's a whole other plan where France becomes the center of a new Roman empire because they start, they start embracing northern African countries into the European Union, all with the goal of French and France being a center of a new Muslim Roman Empire. So the idea is you're not rejecting civilization, you're replacing one civilization with another. And so he, is, he sees all this happening and he's seeing it going on. And this president is coming about and, you know, and, and what does Islam have to offer him? Well, Islam has answers. His answers to all these existential questions about reality and about, uh, and about uh, what happens when you die. And, and he actually, at some point, wakes up in a sweat thinking, oh, my God, if, if God is looking at me now, he's going to hate me because I've been such a horrible person. And um, so there's a certain moral metaphysical attraction uh, to what Islam has to offer. But Islam also offers him a job. And Islam also offers him women, right? Remember, he has got this attitude towards women, the sex objects. He doesn't really respect them. He has no respect for women. And he goes to the president's house, and, and he's got, you know, uh, he's met, he's mistakenly sees one of the president's wives. The president is some, I'll tell you about the president in a minute. One of the president's wives is 15 years old, of course, right? Young, nubile, sexy. And she comes out 
not covered because she's in his ho- in a, at her home and she runs out screaming, embarrassed. And then there's another wife who's older, less attractive, but she's a great cook. Right? And the president starts saying, you know, you're going to make a lot of money if you come and work for us. Not that money's the issue, but you know, money is how we determine how many wives you should have. Uh, the more money you make, the more wives you could have. Now, Islam allows four for four wives, but you know, you probably don't make enough money for four wives, but you'll probably make enough money for three wives. Think of that opportunity. Think about how young they could be, these wives. And by the end of the novel, the protagonist is projecting, at the end of the novel, he's projecting into the future and how he's going to be converted, how he's going to be married, and how he's going to have his old job back, and how he's not going to ever write anything interesting anymore, but, but he's going to have some purpose in life, and his basic needs are going to be satisfied, and he's not going to have to have this existential fear because he's now on the good side of God. <laughs> so that's the story. That's the story of the novel, right? It's interesting. And to me, it's interesting because a few weeks ago, I did a show on the history, of, on the future of Europe, which some of you I know have listened to and many of you were critical of, where I said that it's the perception that Western civilization is about Christianity. It's the perception that the only option for Christianity, for the West to survive is a return to Christianity. It is that notion that it's going to kill the West. Because either that notion wins out and they go back to Christianity and that's a disaster, or that notion is revealed to be outrageous and ridiculous and stupid, which it is, but they still need something and then Islam just dominates them. So, they, so, so if they stay like this, like the protagonist, cynical and hedonistic and meaningless and no meaning in life, then Islam wins because Islam has a set of values and Islam not just wins, it converts them. Because if you don't believe in anything, but you don't really, be, you're not an atheist, you're not a philosophical atheist, you just don't believe in anything because you can't believe in anything because you don't... Be, and you don't like life, you don't, then why not become a Muslim, right? If the advantage is to being a Muslim. So it seems like there are only two alternatives presented in Europe today. In a sense, three alternatives. Remain the way we are now. Drifting, hedonistic, no children, not caring about the future, Okay, uh, basically kind of postmodern. Option number one. Option number two, rediscover Christianity. Find Jesus and reestablish the, uh, you know, the uh, great Christian empire in Europe. That's why everybody looks to Poland as the example of wonderful, of the, of the way to respond to Islam. The, the, Poland with its combination of nationalism, Catholicism, and, you know, a bit of fascism thrown in there, lack of freedom of speech, things like that. That's the model. That's the ideal, right? So return to Christianity. Right? And the third option is the victory of Islam. Now, in my view, option number one and option number three are the same. Option number one and option number three are the same. That is, if Europe stays drifting, hedonistic, not caring about the future, not having any values, uh, then they will become Muslim. It will become Muslim. Those options are the same. And that's what the novel projects. And I would argue, and the novel argues, right? I'm not sure I agree, but the novel argues that option number two is already impossible. Too much water under the bridge. Europeans are too cynical. They can accept Islam because there are advantages to being Muslim. But there's nothing in Christianity that really appeals to them. Nothing in Christianity that can appeal to them. They're too cynical about their history to go back to Christianity. So they're dead. They're dead. 
Now, the real option, if you will, the fourth option, is not discussed because it doesn't exist from their framework. And this is where I found it interesting, uh, an interview with the author to be really, really interesting. Right? Um, because what is the fourth option? Now, so, so again, three options. Stay the way they are. Not an option, really. That's a zero option because that can't happen. You lose if you stay the way you are. Postmodernism can't sustain culture. D2, complete disintegration, complete lack of values, complete nothingness cannot sustain a culture. That's option number one. Option number two, become Christian. Two problems with that. One, one, you have to become Christian with all the problems that that entails, including, by the way, and, and I think one of the reasons... One of the reasons the, uh, the author or the protagonist in the novel can't become Christian is its attitude towards sex. Right? You can't just marry three women. You can't have sex with anybody. Christianity is an anti-sex religion. And it's an anti-heathenistic religion. It's about sacrifice and suffering. In the novel, he calls it a feminine religion. And I understand why he does that. He calls it a feminine religion because it's fundamentally weak. It's fundamentally about turning the other cheek. Again, I'm not saying that that's my perception of femininity, but this is what he is trying to convey. It's fundamentally about avoiding sex, avoiding vices. Uh, you know, and he, he associates all that with, with, with the feminine. It's about suffering. It's about sacrifice. It's about all the things that Europeans don't really want. They don't really want to sacrifice. It's not that Europeans are, uh, in that sense, altruistic in terms of their personal lives. They're not at all. They're much more hedonistic than they are altruistic. So Christianity is just unappealing. And if it was appealing, how awful would that be if, if Christianity became Com if, if Europe, I'd say, com became committed, not just flirted with, but became committed to Christianity. So imagine the combination of Kantianism and Christianity in Europe. I mean, it's a disaster. And, and it, it's fascist, it's, it's nationalist, and it's deadly. It's deadly. We're not talking about an enlightenment Christianity, whatever the hell that means, right? We're not talking about the, the Christianity of the founding fathers. That is not on the table. That is not an option. We're talking about the Christianity of sacrifice, of a post-Kantian Christianity, of the Christianity as, as, it's, as it's reflected, for example, in the Pope right now. And we're talking about Catholicism as, because Protestantism doesn't integrate enough. If, if Europe, particularly France and Germany, go back to Christianity, it's going to be Catholicism. It's going to be brutal. It's going to be, you know, again, what the Polish and the Hungarians are flirting with right now. The other option is Islam, which is much more appealing. Much more appealing. For men. Not for women, but for men. But, but the novel makes it very clear that deep down, now, whether it's true or not, you guys will tell me. Deep down, French men don't really care about women. French men are the French male chauvinist of the past, and they, they miss the past. They are intimidated by strong women. They are intimidated by feminism. They're intimidated by, uh, by the idea of, of independent women. And what they really want is to put women in their place, and here comes Islam helping them out. Does it for them. Right? By the way, somebody, uh, Jason, on Facebook says, it's interesting that the thought process in the novel doesn't seem to care about the question, is it true? Absolutely, because we live in a post-Kantian, post-modern Europe. What is true? Who cares? It doesn't matter. This is pure pragmatism, if you will, right? But pure Kantianism. There is no truth. There is just what's, what works, what's acceptable, 
what will get you ahead, what will get you the most wives, what will please you the most, what will get you the most satisfaction. There is no pursuit of truth. Now, there's some attempt to convince this guy that God really does exist because, and, I, and I, I'm off track again, but that's okay. I'm, I'm going to go back to, to the fourth alternative in a minute because I was going to tell you about the president of the university. The president of the university um, grew up an atheist, then figured out that atheist, uh, grew up an atheist in Belgium, I think, or in Belgium, I think, and very European, right? And, and figured out that atheism didn't make any sense, that it didn't provide any answers, that it didn't move anything, didn't provide any values. So he turned to, to, to Christianity, to, to Catholicism. And he, he devoted himself to it, and he was a nationalist. So he was a, a Marie Le Pen-like National Front type guy. He was what he calls, in the book they call it, a nativist, right? And he was committed to all that. He was committed to nativism and to, 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 to so-called Western civilization and to religion, to the Catholic. And then he, he, he continuously noticed just the weakness of, of Western civilization, the, 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 you know, how, how apologetic it was and how how it, it, it faded and folded and, and it was giving up left and right. You know, like the Danish cartoons where nobody would show them. People would take down sculptures and paintings of Muhammad all over Europe. Even in America, nobody would show them. It's that, that resignation, that submission, right? The novel's name is Submission, after all. That the West was practicing the middle of the road. They're not standing for anything. And one day... He basically flipped. He gave up Catholicism and converted to Islam. Now he had power. This was a religion he could really embrace because as a man he had power because he could have all these women. As a man he could have power because the religion of Islam is a religion of power versus, again, Christianity which is the book calls a feminine religion, a religion of sacrifice, a weakness of, of Jesus on a cross dying for other people's sin. It's really important, this distinction between Islam and Christianity. Islam is a religion of victory. Islam is a re religion of achievement. I mean, within the context of, of the religion. Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, gets the girl, he gets money, and he establishes a military political empire. Now think about that. The prophet of Islam gets women, has sex, en you know, enjoys it, I guess, right, at some level, but, but has, you know, is, is this worldly in the sense of he has sex, right? But he also has money. He's a merchant. And, and there's nothing wrong with being a merchant. There's nothing wrong with making money inherent in Islam. He, he's a successful merchant. He makes money. And he goes on military crusades, and he wins, right? He wins vast amounts of territory in his lifetime. The, the, the religion of Islam is based on a mythology of success, of a mythology of victory, of a mythology of domination. This is, by the way, why they are so shocked, why they are so upset, why they are so completely, completely um, uh, 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 stunned over the last hundred years, or really over the last three hundred years, of their own failure? How could they be fail? How could they fail? Throughout their history, they have been successful. And Muhammad, ultimately, the original, the original founder of the religion, was incredibly successful. Now contrast that with Christianity, the mythology of Christianity. Christianity is based on. A prophet who pretty much fails at everything, right? Except resurrection. But he fails at everything. So the only way Christianity can get out of this failure is to make him a god. Which is problematic in and of itself because then you have more than one god. But, but, but that's what Christianity does, right? So he, he is, you know, he has friends who betray him. He is then crucified, the most horrible death you can imagine, for sins he didn't even commit. He gains no political power. In his lifetime, he has a few followers. It's not even a movement. It's certainly not a massive religion. He certainly doesn't conquer any territory. Indeed, 
for the first few hundred years. Christianity is oppressed, is, is devastated, is fed to the lions by the Romans. It's, Christianity is, at its founding, a religion of weakness, of political weakness. Why, why uh, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's and give it unto God? Why the separation of church and state in Christianity? Because they have no political power. They can't dream of ever attaining political power that's so weak. Islam can't comprehend the separation of church and state because from its founding, its religious leader was its political leader and a successful at both. In Christianity, that there is no political success until Constantine, right? And then they get brutal, right? And then, then they conquer. And then they get massive, right? But that's not the essence of Christianity. That's not the mythology of Christianity. That's not the founding story of Christianity. The founding story of Christianity is weakness. <sighs> right? Or not, whatever. <laughs> not much action on the, on the chats, on the uh, comments. So, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not... Uh, not sure if anybody's following, everybody agrees, everybody disagrees, everybody just stunned. How could Iran even say that? That's crazy. I, I don't know. Um, it's nice to get feedback, in other words. It's, I, I, miss, I miss teaching in the classroom where you can actually see people's faces as you're saying uh, these, uh, these outrageous things. Okay, so Christianity is unappealing unappealing. So when this European intellectual, he's in this void intellectually, faces Christianity, eh, there's nothing there to draw him in. There's nothing there to make it feasible for him to actually become a, a Christian. Islam. Islam has so much so much to give him. Answers to big questions. They go into cosmology and where does the universe come from and all this BS. But more importantly, it gives him a backbone. And it gives him a sex life. And it gives him, right? It gives him a, 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 a career. He gets his job. So these are the alternatives. The alternatives that face Europe are the alternatives that face the protagonist in the novel. And in the novel, the protagonist becomes Muslim and ultimately French society becomes Muslim and ultimately Europe becomes Muslim and Islam dominates Europe um, and, and establishes a new empire. You know, it doesn't go into the future and how, how it gets there, but it just suggests this is what's going to happen. All right, so what are the alternatives that are missing? So what are the alternatives that are missing? Well, two, I think. One is a... Well, one is... A, a, the possibility that Europe adopts a form of Christianity that is um, more confident, more aggressive, more fascist, and that that form of Christianity then rises up in the guise of fascism, Nazism, uh, or, or just plain old Christianity, and wipes out the Muslims. And and I have argued in the past that that's how I see the future of Europe. I see it in the form of concentration camps where, where they're killing Muslims. Islam is a threat, you wipe them out. New crusade. I don't know, reading the novel maybe has moved me to believe less in that outcome and more in the possibility that Islam actually does win in the end. That Islam actually does win in the end. But what is the alternative to all this that isn't even considered in the novel? 
and I think isn't considered in real life. That's the great tragedy. The alternative is the Enlightenment. The alternative is the negation of religion, but in the name of something. In the name of human values, in the name of human happiness, in the name of you know, the pursuit of happiness. The alternative is Ayn Rand. The alternative is, is a secular, you know, what, what Leonard Peikoff in, in Dim calls the I, a real integration. The alternative is Aristotle. It's the Greeks. It's to connect, reconnect with ancient Greece and reconnect and, and look at America, at least in its founding, as a model to move forward. But that is out. That's not even an option in the book. That's not even conceivable. And I was reading an interview with the author, and it was interesting. Um, he says, and I'm just looking for the quotes. This is what he says. Um, let's see. So he says, so he's being asked a question. This is the question. Uh, 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 the same people are often militant anti-racists and fervent defenders of secularism with both ways of thinking rooting in the Enlightenment. And, and why is that? Wrong. And, and the author of Submission says, look, the Enlightenment is dead. May it rest in peace. On the level of what we customarily call values, Muslims have more in common with the extreme right than with the left. There is a more fundamental opposi opposition between a Muslim and an atheist than between a Muslim and a Catholic. So he says, you know, that, that, that in like Masden, he later on says, my book describes the destruction of the philosophy handed down by the Enlightenment, which no longer makes sense to anyone or to very few people. Catholicism, by contrast, is doing rather well. This is a Frenchman talking. This is not me. This is a Frenchman. Catholicism, by contrast, is doing rather well. I would maintain that an alliance between Catholics and Muslims is possible. We've seen it happen before. I'm not sure what he's referring to. It could happen again. Um, so he says, so the question he goes, uh, you, uh, you have become an agnostic. So I'll talk about his atheism in a minute. You have become an agnostic. You can look on cheerfully and watch the destruction of the Enlightenment philosophy. That's a question. And he says, yes, it has to happen sometime and it might as well have be now. In this sense, too, I'm a Comtean. Comtean? Augustine Comte, the guy who who invented the term altruism and gave it its meat and its content. This is the, he's a Comtean, he admits it. He says, so yes, I am hostile to enlightenment philosophy. I need to make that perfectly clear. Ay. So this is, this is what he is. Right? He is saying the Enlightenment's dead. And, and, and early on in the interview, he talks about his atheism. And he says, uh, he says, my atheism hasn't quite survived all the deaths I've had to deal with. His parents had just died. And more, most importantly to him, his dog had just died. In fact, it came to seem unsub uh, unsustainable to me. Uh, he says, I, never, I, I came to realize I never was quite an atheist. I was an agnostic. Usually that word serves to, as a screen for atheism, but not, but not, I think, in my case. When in the light of what I know, I re-examine the question, whether there is a creator, a cosmic order, that kind of thing, I realize that I don't actually have an answer. I thought I was an atheist, yes. Now I really don't know. Now, again, the position they presented themselves is untenable. The, 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 the postmoderns, the, the postmarxists, the, the, the secularists, the, 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 the disvaluing secularists in this world, in this world today. Right? They put themselves in an impossible situation. Again, I, I refer you back to Lena Peikoff's uh, dim hypothesis. Everything is disintegrated. 
Everything is meaningless. It's not a way to live. You can't survive that way. You can't live that way. So they can't handle death. They can't handle tragedy. They can't handle change. They can't find meaning in anything they do, including sex. The, 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 the activity, the, the material activity from which we should gain this immense amount of meaning, right? It becomes completely materialistic and meaningless to them. They can't control the world. They can't control the reality around them. They don't know that they believe in reality. They're just drifting, drifting, drifting. They don't believe in reason. They don't believe in the enlightenment. They don't believe in individuals. Even though they're just individuals. But they know something is missing. Something is missing. They have this huge void in them. The author, in response to another question, says, I think there's a real need for God. And that the return of religion is not a slogan, but a reality. And that is very much on the rise. Now notice, he's saying religion is on the rise not me, not Lena Peikoff. And he's saying it in France in 2016. Now, he is saying religious on the right in Europe. It has to be. Okay, is there any historic precedent for a Christian group or faction turning to Islam to favor a stronger religion over a weaker one? Well, I, I don't know, partially because it's, it's not clear that everybody who converted to Islam converted because they were forced to. I, I, I don't think that's true. Many people didn't convert to Islam. Many Jews and many Christians didn't. They just became second-class citizens. I think if you go to the Balkans, I think if you go to North Africa, I think if you go to Syria, what, what was the Byzantine Empire, I think you will find that most people converted to Islam not because they feared for their life, but because you know, it, it, gave them, it gave them a better life in a sense that it gave them more power. Uh, it gave them more political power, it gave them more uh, economic power, and it gave them more sexual power. Sexual, in, again, in the materialistic sense, right? So I think there's plenty of historical precedent. I think this is indeed, I mean, look at, look at, look at, um, it's really fascinating if you study the history of Islam which, by the way, I've got a course on the history of, of, of the Middle East, which covers a lot of this content, and you can get it on my podcast on Blog Talk Radio. Uh, it's, it's a five-part series on the history of the Middle East. It covers a lot of this. But almost every empire, with exception, uh, with exception of Christianity, almost uh, well, with exception of, let's call it Western European Christianity, almost every empire that conquered the Muslim world then converted to Islam. The Mongolians converted to Islam. Um, the Turks, maybe the most prominent group, converted to Islam. The Mongolians who conquered Iran and conquered Iraq and conquered much of the, of, of, of the Muslim world converted. Uh, when Muslims, so it wasn't just that when Muslims con uh, conquered other countries, they, the people in those countries converted to Islam. But it's true that when other cultures, other religions, conquered Muslims, they converted to Islam. So Islam has been very attractive for cultures throughout history. This is, a, this is not a ridiculous assertion by the author of submission to project a world in which people convert, uh, convert to Islam. Um, all right, Skyler's asking, uh, Skyler was quoting a number of different passages in the Bible, one which, which, which was of strength and one which was weakness, and he was asking me, um, let me try to find this because uh, it's it's a while back. He was asking me, um, well, how do you you know how do you reconcile this? And I don't. Uh, you can't explain the contradiction of, of the in the Bible. The Bible is contradiction. Part of the of the of the genius of the Bible is to write things into it that people can interpret in any way they want. But if you want to see, if you want to see what the essence of the religion is, you go to its founding mythology, you go to the story on which the religion is founded. And again, the story of the founding of the Christian religion, and indeed its early history, is a story of weakness. It's a story, a political, 
political and weakness, but 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 physical weakness, and, that, and that's why it's more mystical, it's more spiritual because they had nothing else. They had nothing else. They were poor. They were destitute. They were suffering. So um, I, I don't try to solve contradictions in the Bible. The Bible is full of contradictions. It's part of what it is. Okay. Uh, I, I, look, I, I appreciate everything you're saying, um, but I, I don't want to get into a big debate about the origins of Christianity or about the nature of Christianity. Uh, you know, um, it's, uh, in my view, Christianity, like, like any religion, is based on faith. It's based on a holy book. These holy books are filled with contradictions. They are filled with sentences that mean whatever you want them to mean, and you can interpret any way you mean. Uh, the exact historical uh, uh, root of Christianity, where it comes from, whether Jesus Christ existed or didn't exist, from, it doesn't really matter to me that much. I suspect that Christianity... Uh, is, as the story goes, a spin-off, a, a cult, a sect that spun off from Judaism. It's, it's similar enough to that. So whether that happened in Africa or in uh, what is today Israel or whether it happened somewhere else, I don't really care. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, while I appreciate the call, and I, I hope you'll continue listening, I really am going to try to go back to my, my thesis here, which is not trying to explain Christianity and trying to analyze Christianity, I think what I've said is true about Christianity, but it really is, and it's not about its roots because we don't really care about the roots. Uh, again, what I care about is the founding story. The founding story is the story of Jesus Christ. And the question is, what does that founding story tell us about the religion? And the founding story is about his crucifixion. And it's a story about this, the, the, the fact that he is persecuted by Rome and the fact that he is impotent in the face of that Roman persecution. Now, the way, again, Christianity gets around all this is by turning it into a god. But that's a cop-out. That's a cop-out to create a trilogy, a, a trinity of God that, that it, it, it's almost not monotheistic. It, it's meaningless. Uh, he, you know, he, 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 what people see up on the cross is a man suffering for their sins. That is not a projection of power and success and, and political or military or, e or existential achievement, which is what Islam has. Islam is, a, I believe, an incredibly powerful religion because, and, and a very appealing religion, because of its focus on victory, because of its focus on success, because of its focus on this world, it's less about the next world, it's more about this world. Anyway, but but... And it's not even what I think, which is important here. What's important is what these Europeans think. And I take this author to be an intelligent, intellectual, sophisticated European. Right? And this is the conclusion he's coming to. <laughs> he's saying Europeans need God. They need religion. All right? I, I agree with that. I think they do. Because they need an integrating factor. They need what Leonard Peikoff shows in his Dim Hypothesis. You need truth. Secular philosophy has rejected truth. But you need truth. You need a standard. And if secular philosophy has rejected that standard, then what? Then you turn to religion to try to find it. You turn to religion to try to find it. And that is what that is what the protagonist of the novel does. Turns to Christianity, can't find it there, therefore turns to Islam. Um, and again, there's a certain element of pragmatism there because, uh, because Islam offers him not just truth, but it also offers him money and sex. Right? So, you know, that's, that's where we are, right? That's where we are. Um, now, uh, Jason asks me another question. Food for thought. If D2 and Christianity will lose to Islam, doesn't that also mean that so-called moderate Islamic movement would also lose to the devout Islamic movement? Uh, yeah. Yes, but it also, it also depends what you mean by moderate and what it means to be devout. And, of course, all of them will fail, right? So, so at the end of the day, religion has to fail and religion will fail because it's detached from reality. 
and Islam will fail, and Islam did fail, right? Islam, in spite of its conquest and in spite of everything, it had a short golden era because of its discovery of Aristotle. And then, and then even though it convinces people to adopt its religion as a culture, as a civilization, it's empty, it's useless, it, it, it completely withers. And, and as the West, of course, completely outshines it by the time you get to the 17th, 18th, certainly 19th and 20th century. And that's part of the frustration. That, that's part of the existential angst that, that Muslims feel is why, how can this be happening? Given that we are the, the true religion, given our past successes. All right, so um, there you have it. Uh, the review of this book, which suggests the same, in different ways, the same choices that I believe that you have faced us today. They might, in the book, they come to different, uh, they make the different choice than I believe will be made. But, you know, I, I'm... I, 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 I'm willing to accept the novel's conclusion more than I was in the past because he makes a good case for the superiority, if you will, in terms of attractiveness of Islam over Christianity. Now, and again, to somebody who is secular and who doesn't care anyway, then I'll take the one that gives me more stuff. It's not about truth, right? Remember, it's not about truth. Truth is gone. Can't destroy truth. So what's the solution? The solution is the other alternative. And the other alternative is, is the enlightenment. The other alternative is a rediscovery of reason. The other alternative is a rediscovery of truth in this world. The other alternative is a, is a, is a, is a resurrection of enlightenment philosophy. But this is the thing. There is nobody to do that other than Ayn Rand. So there's some effort by the so-called the new classical liberals to do it. You know, the, 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 the Sam Harris and, uh, and uh, Dave Rubin and some who maybe are slightly libertarian or some who are slightly more statist, uh, even, even um, our friend Fleming Rose. So there's some effort on the part of cultural intellectuals today to try to bring back the values of the Enlightenment. But the fact is that none of these figures have solved the problems that the Enlightenment presented us with. Uh, the incompleteness of their defense of reason, the incompleteness of their defense of the pursuit of happiness, the lack of definition of happiness, the lack of the ability to defend individual rights and to defend capitalism and to defend most importantly, I think, egoism and reason. So that, that, that while, while the Enlightenment presented us with egoism and reason, they couldn't fully defend them. They had an eye, an integration, a true integration, which they couldn't fully articulate and fully defend. And this is what Khan did. He came in and he took advantage of that and he wiped the floor with them. He showed how pathetic and useless they were. And how wrong they were. Because, well, he didn't prove that. But he, sh he presented that to the world. And the world bought it. Because of the weaknesses. The deep, deep, deep weaknesses in the Enlightenment philosophy. The only person who has solved the problems with Enlightenment philosophy. Advanced the cause of Enlightenment philosophy. Closed or, or, or eliminated the weaknesses that exist in Enlightenment philosophy is Ayn Rand. And until Ayn Rand is taken seriously by the better intellectuals in the culture, until Ayn Rand is taken seriously by the likes of the equivalent of a Sam Harris, a Steven Pinker, uh, 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 you know, Dave Rubin, who I think takes them more seriously than most. Uh, 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 Fleming Rose and so on, who re really study her, really understand, really understand the, the weaknesses in Enlightenment thinking that Kant pointed out and how Ayn Rand solves those issues. Until that is understood, 
and that there's a cohort of intellectuals advocating for the enlightenment. We're not going to win. And there are just too few of us. So uh, that code would ideally be objectivist. But it didn't have to be just objectivist. But it would have to be people who appreciated Ayn Rand as a philosopher. And we're just not there. These people just don't exist. They don't exist. And there would be hundreds of us. Hundreds of us. Then the Enlightenment becomes an alternative. And then you can save Western civilization. But I fear that Western civilization might have to be wiped out so that it is then rediscovered, this time rediscovered maybe even through Ayn Rand in some future era, and built on a proper foundation and therefore sustainable into its future. But how that happens, when that happens, who knows? But that's, you know, uh, we at the Institute think of ourselves Anka Gatte really uh, drove this home once out in in-house philosopher. That our job at the Institute is to save the Enlightenment. That's what the battle is for. The battle is to present the world with a with an alternative to the nihilism of of, of, of secular philosophy, the the uh, and the absurdity and the irrationality of the religious alternatives to that secular philosophy. That's our job. That's what your job is if you're listening, if you believe in this, if you want a better world. Your job is to be the ground troops in a war to defend, forget Western civilization, nobody knows what that means, to defend the Enlightenment, to defend Enlightenment philosophy, to defend Aristotle. All right. Um, we're going to take another caller. So again, you're going to experience the echoes. Hi, you're on the Iran Book Show. Who's this? Well, let's just let's just do this. Let's just do this. I, you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna debate you right now, uh, because that's not what I want to do. I, I have no interest in debating religion. At some other point, we'll do a show on religion. Uh, and plus, I've got this echo problem, and I can't really take calls, and I can't really engage you on a call because I can hear myself speak, and it's just a it's just a disaster today. So once I figure out all these issues, um, and we do a show on religion. I'd be happy to debate you on religion, but the fact is, the fact is, everything I've said about religion is true. Um, you know, and, and religion is, is, a, is, is, a, is the number one problem in the world today, uh, the Muslim religion, the, the Christian religion. And, uh, but the problem is that the secularists are now much better because their religion has become cynicism, skepticism. So th there's no way to go other than to rediscover the Enlightenment, to rediscover those values, to re-embrace them, to, to, to embrace them this time on a more solid, more, ju you know, more, more substantial foundation. All right, if, if, there are any, if there are any last questions on this topic before, uh, before we call it a night, then uh, feel free to write them in the chats in bold. Uh, in either in either uh, blog talk or on uh, Facebook. Otherwise, we are going to close out and call it a night, which I think is what we're going to do. All right. Uh, thank you all. Hopefully you, I don't know if enjoy is the right word, but you found that interesting. Uh, I recommend reading the book because I think it, it is an interesting book. Uh, I'm not going to talk about Europe for a while unless something happens because I think I'm, I've said everything I've got to say about this issue. Um, let me just end with this. You can't side with any of the false alternatives. It's not that if you became Christian, it's better than if it became Islam, Muslim. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Um, there is no good outcome here. The only thing you can do is fight for the truth, is fight for values, is fight for reason and individualism. That's it. To ally ourselves with the nationalists, the religionists, is to kill any chance of ever winning this battle. 
It's to kill any chance of winning the battle for civilization. They are the enemies. They are not our friends. We don't have any friends. That's the sad reality. We don't have any friends. We have some friends. I consider people on the left like Harris and Steven Pinker as friends. People on the right, like again, some of the free market thinkers, people like Dave Rubin. I don't know if he's right, left, center. People, our allies, in a sense, are not left and right. Our allies are people who still believe in reason and individualism. If you don't believe in reason and individualism, if you're a collectivist, you are no friend of mine. And I am not going to form any coalitions with you to defeat Islam. Because Islam, at the end of the day, is too weak to be a threat. The threat is us. The threat is Europe. The threat is Europe converting to Islam or Europe converting to Christianity or some other form of M2, which is as disastrous. That is the threat. You cannot ally with one of those parties. And the only thing that can save us from that threat, again, individualism, reason. Thank you all. Have a great week. Oh, one more thing. Well, no, I'm not going to do it. Uh, what I want to do in the future is, is once every couple of weeks, once every month, do a Q&A, live Q&A on here. Just questions. No agenda. Just questions. We, we're going to launch that at some point here soon. Uh, but I need to figure out all these tech problems. Of course, I'll figure them out for three months and then uh, Facebook and uh, YouTube will change something and uh, it'll all be messed up again. Uh, but uh, stay tuned. I'm hoping to have, if I can, if I can solve the technical problems the next week or so, I'm hoping to have a Q&A, uh, an open live Q&A with me uh, sometime here very soon. All right. Thank you all. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to the Iran Brooks Show. Talk to you next week.